Well, thank you, Christian, for the kind introduction. And um, thank you for letting me speak in this webinar series. And uh, welcome to everybody to my talk about uh, Spacelight, a new tool for fingerprint searches in ultra large chemical spaces. Okay, so traditionally in similarity search and uh, also then especially in fingerprint searching, um, you have a query compound, you have a chemical space and you screen that's the chemical space sequentially. So you assess the similarity to the query compound for each um, product of the space or each compound of the space individually. And in order to be able to do this, you have to have a list of the compounds or you have to enumerate the compounds of the chemical space. The largest chemical space enumerated today or the largest spaces are in the billions. So somewhere around here. And um, already the quite prominent element real space is an order of magnitude larger than that. And if we look at the top of the picture here, yeah, so we have 10 to the 11, 10 to the 16, 10 to the 20 compounds in a single space. This is not just a couple of compounds more, yeah, this is many orders of magnitude larger. So these spaces you cannot enumerate uh, anymore. So you cannot do a classic fingerprint search because yeah, the sequential approach just does not work. So there is a limit to this classic sequential search approach or the library enumeration itself. Maybe it's at 10 to the 10 compounds or 10 to, to the 11 compounds, but somewhere there's this limit. There is a limit. And if you want to go beyond that, you, you just need another approach. And this is what I want to show you today. Okay, so most of you uh, already know molecular fingerprints very briefly. They um, represent a molecule by a bit string. And each bit of the bit string represents a chemical substructure. The bit is set to zero if the chemical substructure or chemical feature is not present in the molecule and it's set to one if it is present. And the two types of fingerprints I will um, talk about or which are currently incorporated within Spacelight is the quite well-known ECFP fingerprint, which um, considers all circular chemical features of a compound. And the other one is the connected subgraph fingerprint or CSFP for short that we, um, that we, designed, uh, uh, we designed exactly for this application in these ultra large chemical spaces. And it considers all chemical features of a compound. And um, very briefly for notation with ECFPX, I mean the ECFP fingerprint that contains only circular features with a diameter of at most X. And CSFP Y point Z means the fingerprint that contains all chemical features with a number of heavy atoms between Y and Z. Within Spacelight, you have three different versions of the CSFP. The one that is the default is the FCSFP, which uh, gives you a very fine-grained similarity measurement. What that means, I will uh, talk about later. The ICSFP um, is more an MCS-like descriptor, so um, the present of presence of a chemical feature is tracked, but not its chemical surroundings. And the third one is the TCSFP, which is a little bit less fine-grained, but then in turn has a higher scaffold hopping potential. Okay, so. We will use this classic concept of fingerprints that most of you may know, but we will um, wrap it in a new search, in a new combinatorial search approach, Spacelight. Okay, so two slides ago, I said that we want to avoid the enumeration of all compounds of a chemical space. And one possibility to avoid this is using combinatorial chemistry. This is a reaction scheme I will use throughout the presentation as an example. Uh, we have two consecutive reactions. In the first one, um, we have fragments from two pools, pool A and pool B, and they generate an intermediate product forming a triazole. And then this intermediate product together with another fragment from a pool C is used um, to generate an amide bond. And then this is the final product. So each product contains the, this triazole and this amide bond. And um, if we now assume that we would pick a thousand fragments for each pool. So we have a thousand choices to make for each of these uh, um, positions 
in the reaction, then we would end up with a million, already a million intermediate products and a billion products. Yeah? And this is kind of a big discrepancy and uh, shows the potential of combinatorial chemistry in this, um, in this scenario, because we have yeah, one, one billion products, but on the other side, we have only 3000 fragments. So our goal, or what we actually did, is we search in the fragment space, in this case of 3000 fragments, but while doing this, we approximate the similarity in the product space of the billion products without actually enumerating all these products. Okay, so this is our goal. And how do we do this? So first of all, we have to gather all the information that we can get from this reaction scheme. The first thing that we notice is um, that new bonds are formed during the reaction, obviously. So there are two, two bonds formed here in the triad soul, and then we have this amide bond formed as well. So we have to keep track of this. And um, also there are structural changes going on in the educts or the fragments once they are part of the product. So for example, we have here this triple bond for fragments from pool B, but once they are in the intermediate product, this triple bond is not existent anymore. It's now part of the, of the triad zone. Yeah? So we have to keep track of this as well. So to capture the newly formed bonds, we define something called a topology graph, which has a node for each pool used in the reaction scheme. So here pool A, B, and C. And then we uh, add bonds between these pools that resemble the newly formed bonds. So for example, between pool A and B, we have the two aromatic bonds that which are formed uh, within the triad soul. And then we have uh, a single bond running between pool B and C for this amide bond. Okay. And in addition, we change the representation of the fragments. Um, Markus Gastreich coined the term future fragments. I think it's, it's really nice and has a nice ring to it um, because um, we want the fragments to look like, um, to, look, to look the way they, they are when they are part of the product. So what do I mean by this? For, if we have this fragment for pool A, for example, we know, okay, there's a triad soul formed, so we attach R groups and actually resemble this triad soul within the fragment. Yeah? So it looks, the configuration looks as if it was part of a product. And we do the same for the other pools in pool B. This means removing the triple bond and actually uh, or making change into a double bond and um, adding three residues. So this is then the other part of the triad soul, the two carbons of the triad soul. And we have here another R group for the amide bond. And we do the same for pool C. Yeah, so this is, these fragments now with their configuration look like um, they, they are when they are part of a product. Okay, so assume now this is our topological fragment space consist, consisting of a topology graph. In theory, it can contain more than one graph, but as in, to keep the example small, we have only one topology graph. For each pool, we have two fragments to choose from in our future fragment representation. And now we have a query compound. This is our query. And uh, we now want to search in the space, as I said in the beginning, without enumerating all the products. How do we do this? So this is the overview of the algorithm. We start with a topological fragment space. Um, we start with the query compound. And what we do is we generate partitions of the query compound into substructures. Yeah? And while we do this, we um, keep track of topological similarities. So the partitions look like they could, um, they could be fragment combinations from the space. What I mean by that, I will tell you in a second. Once we've done this, so we generated partitions with substructures, we now compare these substructures to the fragments of the space using classic fingerprint approach, for example, ECFP. Yeah, we, we generate Tanimoto scores, we rank the fragments um, by that Tanimoto score and pick the, pick the ones with the highest score. And once we've done this, we now can, uh, from these fragments that we've chosen, generate combinations and um, conclude their scores to give each combination or each product of the space a, uh, a score and repeat this process for all partitions. And in the end, then we get um, 
we conclude the most similar results, the, the most similar products. Okay. So as I said, in the first step, we want to generate partitions. And um, if we assume now this is a, if we look at this partition of the query compound indicated by the black boxes, so each box indicates one um, substructure of the partition. Now, uh, as I said, we want to look if it's topologically similar or not. What do I mean by that? So uh, we want to assign each substructure of the partition to one pool of the graph. And uh, we want to do this in such a way that the substructure of the bonds that leave the substructure, so for example, in this case, this bond, and for these two, then these two bonds, um, have the same, are the same as the bonds that leave the pool. So for example, for pool A, these two aromatic bonds. And in addition, we want that the size of the substructure differs by not more than five to at least one fragment. So it has a similar size to at least one fragment of the pool. And if we are trying to do this for this partition, we can do this for the first, we achieve this for the first um, substructure. It has one single bond leaving the substructure, which is identical to this single bond. The size is similar to, to very similar to this fragment here. Um, but for the other ones, we cannot do this because these are two aromatic bonds and here this is not an aromatic ring. Yeah? So this assignment fails and we will view this partition as not topologically similar. Let's look at another partition and we try the same assignment and here we see, oh, okay, we have an aromatic ring. So these uh, two bonds match those two bonds and the single bond matches this bond and the sizes are also similar. So we can assign it like this, this to pool A pool B and pool C. So this partition would be viewed as topologically similar and would be used in the next step of the algorithm. Okay. So in the second step, our goal is to find fragments that are similar to the substructures from the partition. And as I said, we do this by um, calculating Tanimoto coefficients of, for example, the ECFP fingerprints or the CSFP version fingerprints like the FCSFP. Um, and then we pick the highest rank bonds. If we do this for pool A and the substructure assigned to it, we can see um, we can see that this um, that the substructure is very similar to this fragment. Only the sulfur was changed with the oxygen, and we also see why we actually um, did this uh, future fragment representation. Yes, because now we have these R groups here, and the configuration of the bonds to the R groups is actually here identical to the bonds of the substructure that leave the substructure. So these two bonds would match these two bonds here. So these are very similar, so they would get a quite a high Tanimoto score, maybe 0 0.7 or higher. Okay, so if we do now the same for pool B, we can actually see that this substructure is identical to this fragment. Yeah? Here we have these we have these R groups, and the, the bonds to the R groups actually are identical to, to these bonds and also the, the inner part of the substructure or the substructure itself is identical to, yeah, to the heavy atom configuration of the fragment. So this, we would pick here the first fragment and it would get a tiny motor score of 1.0. So completely identical. Okay, so if we now try to do the same for pool C, we can see, mm, okay, um, this substructure is not very similar to any of these fragments, structurally speaking, but we would probably pick the second one. Okay. So in the next step, in the step three, we now combine the fragments. So we have we have chosen the, these fragments, and now we use the information from the R groups and the information we, we got from the from the um, reaction scheme to generate this product. Yeah? And we can see large portions of the product here are identical to the to the query. And we now want to assign the score to the product. And um, the yeah, the first the fragment from pool A and um, the connected substructure are very similar. So they have a high score. Here we have a score of 1.0 because they're identical. And down here for pool C, we would have a low score. And we get uh, we we um, calculate a weighted sum of these scores as the score for the for the uh, whole compound whole product, 
and um, the weight is given by the size of the assigned substructure. So this year would get a large weight, whereas this year would get a small weight. Okay. And we repeat this whole process for all partitions that we generated. And this is the overview of the algorithm. Okay, now that I explained to you the method and uh, I told you that we incorporate um, classic fingerprints, but do this now in a yeah, combinatorial search approach, the natural question is uh, how similar are the results that you get from Spacelight to, uh, for example, a classic ECFP4 search that, I, that I'm used to. And to answer this, um, we uh, pick a fragment space we enumerate all its products, so the fragment space has to be small in order to be able to do this. Um, we pick a query compound and then you can do two things. You can search on the one hand with Spacelight in the fragment space directly, or you can do a classic fingerprint search, a sequential search over all the enumerated products with the same query. In both cases, you get a list, ranked list of all compounds. So First place is the most similar compound viewed by that method, Spacelight or the sequential fingerprint search. Yeah, and then you rank all products like this. And then you can ask how similar are these lists. And that's exactly what we've done. For um, queries, we chose um, 500 random compounds from the zinc heat like subset. And as a fragment space, we would like the, to use the enemy null space with over 30 billion products. However, this is not possible, yeah? You cannot do a classic fingerprint search on this space because it's, it's too large to enumerate, yeah? The only means by which you can search today the space is uh, with an infinity uh, with a feature tree technology, which is more pharmacophore-like um, descriptor. And now you can do this with Spacelight, which is, has a more fingerprint-based uh, fingerprint character, but you cannot enumerate its product space. So what we did instead from these 180 synthesis protocols, we picked uh, randomly picked three with a small with a small product space, and this was then small enough to be enumerated. Yeah? And then we did this this process. So we have three subspaces of the enemy real space. Okay. So we compare these two lists by two means. The first one is looking at the candles tau of um, the full ranking list. So the, this gives you an insight of the overall correlation of the ranked list from the highest ranked one to the lowest ranked one. And then we also looked at the overlap of the 10 highest ranked compounds. So how similar um, are these two approaches really in the compounds that they view as the most similar? Yeah, and for both cases, we, we took the average over all 500 query compounds. Okay, so um, the candle's tau value can theoretically range from minus one to one. Minus one means that um, the two lists are completely flipped, completely anti-correlated. Mm, one means that they are identical, and zero means that there's on average no, no correlation between the two lists. And overlap, obviously, one means that, that the two, 10 highest ring compounds are completely identical, zero means there's no overlap. We did this analysis for six different types of fingerprints, ECFP 2, 4, and 6, and FCCFP 2.3, 2 uh, 2.4, and 2.5. Okay, so if we look at the results, we immediately see, mm, okay, the results are between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 for both metrics on all spaces. Which is, which is really high, yeah? So they are very similar. And also what we see is that the, um, that the performance or the agreement does not really uh, depend on the fingerprint method that we chose, which is also nice, indicating that you can use the fingerprint method that you like within Spacelight. Spacelight. So our take home message here is that you can use Spacelight um, to search on ultra large chemical spaces and the results you get or the description of molecular similarity is um, similar to a classic fingerprint search. However, now you can search in much, much, much larger spaces. Okay. So I said that they are really similar. However, the, the values that we just saw are not 1.0. Yeah, they are not completely identical. And I want to elaborate a little bit why this is and with an example or a few examples. So this is the topology graph of the second space. So we have two pools of fragments, A and B, and they are um, connected via a double bond in the final product. And this is a zinc compound that's part of the query set. 
and and this is the um, that is uh, the topologically similar partition that is used for the two examples I will just show you with already the assignment to the to the two pools and if we look at this product so this is part of the product space of this yeah the subspace of the enemy real space we can see that it was ranked quite high by the classic ECFP4 so the sequential approach and was ranked a little bit lower by Spacelight using as well the ECFP4 but then with this with its combinatorial search approach and if we look at the differences between the query and this product we can see that they are really similar they have quite a high rank it has a quite a high rank for both approaches but the only difference is the location of this arcane group here yeah? in the query it's up here and in the product it's down here and this is one thing that um, classic fingerprints do not capture to a large extent they they check if a certain um, chemical substructure exists in a compound but not necessarily where it is yeah um i mean implicitly this is contained uh, then in the other bigger chemical features but um yeah it's not tracked that much but for the input for space light which works on the substructures and the fragments this this uh, change differs more because here this substructure contains the alkane group and it's compared with this fragment which does not con contain the alkane group and vice versa this fragment contains the alkane group and this substructure it is, con um, it is compared to is missing it yeah so this change in locality of the um, alkane group is tracked much more within space light let me show you another example to uh, elaborate this um, this is another product of the space which was ranked quite low or lower at least um, with the classic ECFP4 search and ranked higher with uh, space light and if we look at the differences between the query and this product we can see that the sulfur was exchanged with the nitrogen and this carbon chain here was elongated and um, this is another thing of um, classic fingerprint searches that changes of atoms in that are quite central so this is a central atom in the in, the, in both compounds change a lot of um, chemical features in the turn yeah so a lot of um, bits in the bit string change and this um, gives this product such a low rank if we look at the input for space light now we can see that the substructure here is actually identical to this fragment so they would get a tiny motor score of 1.0 and this fragment here is quite different to the substructure so it would get um, a low Tanimoto score however this impacts only this comparison and not the the first one yeah so this also um, shows that space light considers the locality of chemical features so where the chemical features are in a compound to a bigger extent than a classic fingerprint search would okay so let me now talk about runtimes. Uh, for this runtime experiment, we again chose 500 random compounds from the zinc lead like subset, and we use two different chemical spaces. The first one is the enamine real space, now the full enamine real space with over 30 billion products. And the second one is the knowledge space with, with over 10 to the 15 products. So five orders of magnitude larger than the enamine real space. Keep that in mind if you, uh, if you see the results in a second okay for the um for this experiment i used my computer at the university with completely normal specs i uh, i guess most of you have such a computer at home um and we did the we did this runtime experiment for the ecfp4 and the fcfp 2.5 okay so we split up the time needed into a uh, loading step and the actual search. So loading means um, gathering all the fingerprints and topology graphs and, and, and stuff like that from disk. You obviously have to do this only once if you search um, for multiple queries. And then the actual um, search takes on the enemy real space for both fingerprints on average not more than three seconds, yeah, which is really fast, I think. And um, what is really interesting, if we now look at the knowledge space, yeah, the runtime actually decreases a little bit, or at least it's not, it's not longer. Yeah? So also the knowledge space, you can search 
within three seconds, although um, it ha the, the size is um, larger than the enemy loose space by five orders of magnitude. Yeah? So this suggests that you can even search larger spaces with 10 to the 20 um, within seconds uh, using space light. So our take home message here is that you can use space light to search on your own computer or your own laptop at home um, within seconds on these very large or ultra large chemical spaces. Okay. So for the rest of the um, presentation, I want to show you some things that you can do with space light now. Um, so we, we search again in the full enemy real space. Um, and as a query, we use uh, nilutamide, an approved drug. And uh, if we start the search, we find a product with score 1.0, which means that this compound is contained in the enemy real space, which in turn means that you can um, order it from enemy if you, if you like. And this is something um, that you can do now, um, that you can do with space light. You can check the presence or absence uh, in these very large chemical spaces of a certain query. Yeah. And if we look at the second best result um, with a score of 0 0.87, we can see the substructure driven character of space light, like classic fingerprint search. Yeah, we have this substructure here that is also existent in the query. We have this substructure this is that is identical and the middle part is a little bit different. That's why the score is not 1.0. So our take home message here is that you can use space light and you can check really quick in a couple of seconds if you can, for example, order the compound from enamine or uh, if the space, uh, if the compound is existent in your own in-house space or in a publicly available space. And if you do not get a score of 1.0, you know it's not it's not contained. Okay. So another thing uh, you can do with space light involves some um, scaffolds. Um, if we do the same thing, but now we use ensalutamide again, an approved drug, um, as a query, um, the highest score we get is 0 0.62, so not that high, and the compound is not contained in the space. What we can do instead now is we can use another search mode of space light, uh, the scaffold search mode. And this mode detects fragments that form chemical substructures of your query compound for, for example, for further optimization or something like this. Or it gives you, might also give you insight about synthesis routes. If we do this uh, with the FCSFP, um, so in the beginning, I said it's a very fine-grained uh, description of molecular similarity, and it keeps track of the chemical surroundings of a fragment or a substructure within the um, query. We can see that this was the largest um, fragment that forms a substructure using this fingerprint, and we can see that this R group here um, resembles this this bond that leaves the substructure. Yeah, so. <clears throat> This might indicate that you can could maybe use this fragment um, to synthesize this compound or to, to yeah, further optimize it maybe. And um, if we do the same thing now with the ICSFP, so this is more an MCS-like descriptor, you get more of an MCS-like result back. Yeah? Um, we can see this fragment is larger. Yeah? So this is the largest fragment forming a substructure. But um, yeah, the, the chemical surrounding of the um, of the substructure is not matched by R groups in the fragments. So this is more yeah, like a MCS type of search, which can also be interesting at times. So our take home message here is that you can use the scaffold search mode of space light to detect interesting fragments from these or building blocks from these large collections that were used to generate these spaces. Okay. So the last uh, compound I want to show you is uh, nafcillin, um, which is again an approved drug. And but now we search not in the enamine real space, but in the knowledge space, because this space is publicly available, and I can actually show you uh, the synthesis protocol used to generate the space. And um, yeah, if we do the search, we actually find it back with a score 1.0, and now we can look at the building blocks of the fragments. Um, and the reaction used to generate this product, or nafcillin in this case. 
because it was uh, it was um, it can be generated using these um, building blocks and the schotten baumann reaction and this is also very interesting information yeah so you get uh, you can actually retrieve the information um, or the, the um, chemical reactions that were used to generate these spaces and yeah get insights on how to do um, maybe synthesize the compound okay so um, now we again search in the real space but not with a single query but multiple ones um, we chose all approved drugs from the drug bank with a molecular weight between 300 and 500 so these were um, 860 compounds and if you do the search the whole run takes 22 minutes or took 22 minutes um, on the same on the same computer that i um, on with the same specs i showed you during the runtime experiment so um, 1.6 seconds per compound on average and what we can do now is we can group the these 860 compounds by the highest score of a product they got yeah and then we can see 14 of uh, of those had a score of 1.0 so we they are contained in the real space and we could order them from enemy then we have another 100 192 that have a score above 0 0.7 so they are in the vicinity of uh, the enemy real space quite similar to at least one product but a large portion or the larger portion actually has a um, score of less than 0 0.7 or even less than 0 0.4 so this is very dissimilar and this is kind of interesting because i mean the chemical space around these proof drugs i'm you you would uh, guess is quite um well studied yeah and the space is really large 13 billion products no enumerated space has this size but still most of the compounds are not very close to uh, and to the product space of the enemy real space and this suggests that you need even larger spaces to yeah actually cover um cover chemical space to a satisfying uh, extent yeah so you probably need spaces of 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 25 or maybe even 10 to the 30 compounds and for this uh, for chemical spaces of this size you certainly need a combinatorial search approach like space light okay so let me conclude what i've just said from a user perspective you are, you are now able to explore these ultra large chemical spaces with 10 to the 15 or more compounds. The um, results that you get are similar to a classic fingerprint search that you know. Um, you, in addition, get ideas for synth synthesis routes for your compounds. You can find um, scaffolds from large building block collections, and you can do all of this on your own laptop within seconds. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Special thanks to uh, Markus Gastreich and Christian Lemon for, for letting me speak here. Um, thanks to Matthias Rarei, my supervisor, and Patrick Penner, my co-author co of my paper that you can see up here. So uh, it's still an ASAP um, article in JCIM, but I think it will be published soon. And um, this is my wonderful research group. And yes, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions.